So what I want to talk about is um, what Doug really meant by augmentation, by human uh, augmentation and by creating uh, technologies that actually augment and boost the capacity of human beings. And also why we're kind of, we're, we're not getting that quite right at, at the moment. So I'm going to start with uh, an agenda that was really Engelbart's agenda when he was giving a uh, conference at the uh, World Library uh, Association. And Engelbart's first agenda in presenting uh, what augmentation really meant is to distinguish between augmentation and automation. So we see a lot of automated systems around us and how do we distinguish an automated system from true augmentation? Um, I'm also going to have a look at what Doug meant by the capability infrastructure and how we can contribute to that using the tool system. And then we're going to have a look at what he meant by co-evolution. So how we can use uh, the tool system to improve the human system and consequently improve our capability as a species. So Doug really thought in term, at, at this uh, kind of species level, uh, species level thinking. Okay, so for Doug, a human being comes with some innate skills. You've got, um, in the, the human system has some innate skills, for example, the capacity to hear. I've only got one ear that works, but um, we, we come with the capacity to hear, we come with the capacity to see, uh, we, we are able to use our hands and our hands work well with um, the visual system. And we also acquire tools along the way into the human system. So we're not born with the ability to speak, for example. We learn that, that's an acquired skill. Language is acquired. And he actually uses a software metaphor for this. He calls it uh, installing, installing language um, into the human system. So the ability, for example, to program or to use a keyboard or to uh, work out how to use um, the camera on iOS is an acquired skill. And uh, this is kind of is part of the human system. So for Doug to design effective technologies, what you really need to do is locate one of these um, existing human capabilities, whether it's acquired or uh, whether it's innate, and then boost that particular capability using technology so that you can accomplish something using the tool system and the human system together that can't be accomplished uh, on its own. So tools should be used to boost the human system. So um, within the tool system, we include things like uh, the obvious, like technologies, but we also include um, machinery and um, uh, vehicles and uh, facilities and uh, even, even the um, contact lenses that I'm wearing at the moment would be part of the tool system. And I'm using those to boost an existing human uh, capability, which is um, sight. So when we combine what is in the tool system, both acquired from outside, like language and paradigms and techniques like computer programming, when we combine that with the human system, we have what we're capable of as a species. So Doug really wanted from the beginning when he was designing what he called uh, the online system, which was the first uh, hypertext system and uh, really the first uh, screen-based computer system, he was wanting to boost our capacity as a species to deal with knowledge. So again, this species level thinking, locating a human capability and then boosting that using technology. So this is the idea behind the tools that he designed and uh, the way he wanted people to design things right up until uh, he died which is to boost what we're capable of as a spe as species, which he called our collective um, IQ. So ideally, um, you would look inside the human system and you would find something uh, within there that we, uh, that, is, uh, that we can boost, that we can um, augment. So I'll give you an example of this. Um, so this is his uh, online system. So prior to the online system that he uh, created, human beings really had not used um, screens, screen-based computing before. They certainly hadn't used a mouse, they hadn't used a keyboard, um, and they weren't actually used to uh, kind of moving around in an information space. 
And so what uh, NLS did when he was designing it was to take our inherent capability to think in terms of symbol manipulation, which comes from language, and externalise that onto uh, a machine, in this case uh, a screen so that you can see the symbols and uh, a mouse so that you can manipulate um, the symbols on the screen and tell the computer what you're actually looking at. So he's taking an existing human capability and he's boosting that using the um, tool system. <coughs> so I want to give you an example of another well-designed tool here. So a pencil or a pen is also a very well-designed tool and we've had hundreds of years to adjust to and to learn how to use that effectively so that it is very efficient, so that we can get our language, our thoughts out onto paper efficiently. It's been uh, designed so it's slimline and the surfaces that we inscribe upon have evolved over the years so that paper becomes uh, the most effective one. Now, you don't really understand how well-designed tools are uh, that we use every day until they're what's called de-augmented. So I'm gonna give you an example of a a de-augmented tool. This is a, an example that Doug used to use himself. So what he'd actually do to explain the importance of well-designed tools that boost our ability, boost our capability, is he would strap a brick to a pencil and he would get people to write with this. And you can see uh, on the right hand side of the screen there, an example of someone trying to write with a brick pen. And it's all kind of it looks like something my son would come up with who's in you know grade five it's it, the letters are very big it says laborious it takes a long time to kind of produce now with a badly designed tool like this you need to think of the cultural ramifications so if it was that difficult to write how would we have a scholarly culture how would we have books how would we have kind of the um, literary and uh, uh, scientific culture that we have now if it was that difficult to write? So tools actually affect the human system and what we're capable of as a species. If it had been that hard to write, we simply wouldn't have the novels and the manuscripts and the scientific treatises that we do today. So that's his example of uh, deal augmentation. Now, the other thing to remember about tools before I come to contemporary tools is that we learn from our tools. So it's not a one way uh, relationship where we shape our tools and then we use them and we go about our business. So we actually learn from our tools. Nothing is natural. Everything is acquired in Doug's model. So all parts of the human system are installed from language to the ability to ride a bike, for example. So what we need to do when we're thinking about designing tools is we want to design the most efficient tool that kind of um, boosts the particular capability of the human. And it may actually be difficult to learn how to use that. So to explain that, he used the uh, tricycle bicycle analogy. It's really easy to hop on a tricycle and get around, but you don't, get, you don't go terribly fast, do you? A bicycle is a very well-designed tool. It goes much faster, it's more efficient, but it takes time to learn. So if you stick a four-year-old on a bike that doesn't have trainer wheels, it's gonna take a couple of years for them to be able to get around uh, very fast. So we need to learn to use our tools as well as um, designing them to boost us. So this is the methodological basis of what Doug called bootstrapping. So it's this, uh, it, it does kind of hail back to the cybernetic, cybernetic era where we see the human as a system and the tool as a system and they're in this kind of uh, feedback loop. So that's what bootstrapping is about, using the tool system to boost the human system and kind of getting somewhere um, on, on that basis. And that uh, methodological um, kind of framework is what drove uh, the development of uh, the NLS system. And because it has kind of um, diffused into popular culture and onto pretty much every screen that we see, this Windows interactive menu pointing device um, framework, this uh, bootstrapping methodology has really diffused through culture uh, in that sense. It hasn't changed much. That's what's most surprising about studying the history of this system to me. 
uh, we, we haven't changed all that much in um, however many decades uh, since he's uh, first designed this. We're still working uh, at screens. We're still working with menus. We're still working with uh, the same kind of uh, paper-based uh, paradigm. So the next question we want to ask that concerns contemporary technologies is how do we know if it's really augmenting uh, an existing capacity of the human being or if it's just kind of automating something, right? This is uh, a question that we need to ask when we're designing or creating uh, technologies, a question I ask myself. I mean, I code and I, I help teams to create apps. And you need to ask yourself, are you just kind of automating something that already exists or you're actually creating a new capacity or boosting a capacity that didn't exist um, without the technology? So automation, as Doug points out, is, uh, so this is another of Doug's slides, is uh, the, really uh, what most uh, computer programs are used for today. They replace the work that we used to do. Um, augmentation is different and it creates a new capacity. And uh, to explain that, I usually go straight to my daughter, who was also born deaf, and uh, the cochlear implant. So uh, my daughter, Laura, was born profoundly deaf. Um, she was implanted uh, at 11 months old and she's now talking uh, like any normal five-year-old kid and goes to a, a mainstream school and you actually wouldn't know she had uh, cochlear implants because she uses language so effectively. In fact, she won't shut up. But the point is that she would otherwise be signing so what the technology here has done is taken uh, an existing uh, capability, uh, in this case, an impaired capability, and boosted it, created something that simply did not exist before. And in turn, it has shaped the human being. So her brain would be different if she signed, if she communicated via sign, and if she uh, kind of had entered into that world of sign. Instead, she's entered into the world of speech and her, into her brain has developed differently. And it actually took a long time to learn to use cochlear implants. So when she was first uh, um, implanted, the, there was an expression of it on her face like, what is that? I've never, I've never heard. I've never heard before. What is sound? So there was this process of learning how to use the implants uh, in order to uh, kind of boost her capacity and to um, speak. Um, another example of a, a technology which um, is really uh, quite exciting in terms of augmentation is um, the use of um, augmented reality when you're uh, trying to fix aeroplanes or doing remote surgery, for example. So this is uh, boosting your capacity in that the surgeon is not actually present uh, with the patient, but um, you're, you're able to kind of um, extend over vast distances to heal people. Or if you're fixing uh, the engine of uh, an airplane, for example, there's thousands upon thousands of pages um, that you'd otherwise have to lug around that can be projected onto uh, what it is you're fixing and the information can kind of appear in real time and boost your capacity to kind of um, fix, fix a person or uh, a machine simply by having that uh, information projected onto, uh, the, onto uh, reality, augmented reality. So technologies that extend our capability create something that was not there before. They serve, they serve the um, user, they serve you first. So the cochlear implant is designed to serve the user. You put it in so that um, the person who receives it can actually speak. And if you're fixing the engine of an aeroplane, the, uh, the, uh, augmented, the um, augmented reality system is designed to serve the engineer. So you don't have to lug around thousands and thousands upon pages. Uh, it's simply projected onto uh, the machine. So one important thing for, to remember in the point that I'm about to make is that the user is not the product in um, an, a system which truly augments uh, a human being. The user is not the product. You are what is being boosted. It is your capability that is being boosted. So that brings me to a few uh, contemporary platforms that I am perhaps uh, a little bit critical of uh, in my work. Uh, for example, um, 
Facebook. So Facebook does enable us to, as they are fond of saying, connect to uh, other human beings. But what is it actually doing? It's actually using, the user is the product. So when you are talking to your high school um, friend who you lost contact with a long time ago, you're, you're making that connection and it is automating that connection for you. But the data that you share, your private data, is actually the product, which is uh, used to sell uh, advertising and to kind of fund, uh, the, fund the platform. So Amazon is a little bit different in that it um, is making recommendations to you about further products to purchase. So it is automating this kind of searching through releases to figure out what is useful to you because it's personalized. But again, it's about making money and um, the, the kind of the business platform is not to boost your capability as a human being. Uh, it's actually to sell you things. So the price of, um, particularly on social media, and although I'm quite active on Twitter, um, I, we have to admit, what is the product of kind of sharing this much data and um, having a platform? Well, the price is your data. And as I've been saying, these platforms are not designed to boost you, to boost your capacity as uh, a human being. They're designed to serve um, a different master, and that is uh, advertisers. So ideally, technologies are designed to serve you. You're, you're the master. <laughs> They're meant to be designed to boost your capacity. Um, and I would argue, actually, that some of these platforms have been designed to actually leverage and, in a way, exploit certain human capabilities. So we are very, are very visual creatures. Uh, we have a tendency to kind of um, narrow in on things that are bright and baubly and uh, attractive and to kind of click through exciting things that um, are visually rich and stimulating. And this is maybe uh, an innate human capacity which helped us when we were searching for food in the jungle, for example. However, on Facebook, um, the circuits of sight are kind of leveraged in order to sell us things or to, to make the platform sticky. Again, it's about that the, this particular platform is designed where you're the product and you're the time, your eyeballs, uh, your eyeball time and the time you spend on the platform, what you click on and uh, the advertisements you see, that's the product. Um, so really the purpose of what I'm talking about is to see if we can come up with an alternative paradigm, an alternative paradigm which is more in tune with do what Doug was originally talking about. So designing our tools so that they really actually boost an existing human capability or create a new one entirely. So the, the problem with this is that technologies need to be monetized. They cost money to, uh, to develop. And um, so NLS, for example, was extremely expensive to buy and cochlear implants are $50,000 per side. So technologies that really do boost your capacity can be expensive. So how do we fund them? Particularly if we're talking about um, software platforms, how do we fund software platforms which are really designed to boost your capacity and to have not, you're not the product. They're designed to boost your capacity. How would we fund that? There, I mean, there are a couple of different ideas and um, uh, obviously open source and kind of um, uh, asking for donations is one paradigm, but that is not going to raise, um, you know, half a billion dollars to create um, a large scale uh, platform. So some ideas that people have come up with, for example, Ted has been talking about this for a long time, is having a micro um, payment or microcurrency system, uh, which could perhaps be a transaction layer over everything, which is again, making the user pay for the technology and um, making the user pay for uh, the privilege of using the technology and to be boosted and to have their capacity boosted rather than they uh, be the product. So your data, for example, is worth about $500 to Google a year. And you don't pay Google $500 a year. Uh, it, what happens is that your data uh, is used to uh, sell you things so that they can uh, make that money. So would you be prepared to actually pay for technologies that boost your capacity and don't kind of have you as, uh, as the product? It's just an idea, right? Just an idea to think about. We do need an alternative uh, business model. I mean, in reality, we have to uh, pay for these things. 
So what I'm really wanting to say uh, in this particular presentation is that we need to go right back to square one and think of alternative ways of designing and monetizing technologies so that they can be built to augment our capacity. We may not have uh, $50,000 lying around to uh, pay for a particular technology. Perhaps we need to pay in micropayments um, as we use it, for example. But existing, uh, particularly existing software platforms uh, and the world that we appear to be evolving into is an algorithmic um, one, one of uh, big data where we are the product. We are no longer uh, the user being boosted. We are literally the product, our data. So uh, I would like to have us come back to square one and think about how we might uh, design technologies that boost our capabilities rather than exploit them. And um, that's what I'll leave you with. Hopefully you won't be watching this particular video, but... <laughs>